Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, the to Change Now in the session on food, sustainable food. Uh, we've got some uh, great guests from all over the world uh, here in France, here in Paris, where we where we're filming uh, this morning, uh, and also on the other side of the world in New Zealand. We'll introduce them all in a moment. Um, this session. Uh, th these past three days have been uh, uh, filled with interesting um, topics, um, more or less uh, abstract, more or less um, uh, 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 tangible, more or less close to home. There's nothing I think that people uh, understand better, care more about uh, than food and figuring out um, how we eat it, how we get it, where it comes from. Uh, opinions are strong, uh, tastes uh, are different, um, and we're going to, um, we're going to, to, we have three different uh, um, parts of this, uh, of this session, um, basically broken down into production, uh, distribution, and consumption. And we're going to start with consumption, and we're going to start by going on the other side of the world, literally, to New Zealand, where we have uh, uh, a special guest uh, who's up late in the evening or in the, in the early evening uh, in New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, welcome Susie Amos Cameron. Susie is a former uh, actress, top model, and for a long time now been uh, a well-known uh, global activist for environmental causes and specifically about uh, sustainable food. Um, and welcome, Susie. Uh, how are things in New Zealand? How was your day? My day was beautiful. It, we're actually heading into winter time now. But I want to say bonjour tout le monde. Je suis tellement ravi d'être ici. Ah, voila. So Susie, I spoke with Susie yesterday. Susie has a fascinating life, which included, I guess, three or four years uh, in Paris uh, as a, at the beginning of her, of her modeling career. And so uh, uh, we'll bring it, bring it full circle. Um, uh, thanks again, Susie. So, so um, you know, the, this past year, uh, year and a half now, I guess we can say, uh, has, has changed the world. Uh, has changed the way we look at the world, uh, the cha the, changed the way we live our, live our lives, um, and of course has changed uh, the, our relationship with food. If food is, is the thing we probably talk most about, except perhaps what we're doing right now, uh, speaking remotely, uh, into you speaking into your computer, and uh, those two things, but food, um, what, 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 have, what have you noticed over this past year um, in terms of uh, your own uh, habits, your own life, but also perhaps even more important, what you've heard from others? Yeah, I think, um, you know, just in terms of what people have been doing all year, um, you know, in, in the United States, and I don't know about the rest of the world, but there was a shortage of flour and a shortage of yeast because people were home and they wanted to, they wanted to cook and they wanted to bake. Um, you know, my whole world revolves around plant-based eating and the connection with environment and, and health and the animals and, and all of those things. So I think um, in terms of really looking at what people were doing, I was happy to hear that a lot of people were creating these pantry dishes. And because it was difficult to keep animal products fresh because people weren't able to really go out and shop a lot. So people were actually making a lot of plant-based meals out of their pantries, probably without even knowing it, you know, opening a can of beans and a can of tomatoes and making a pasta or rice dishes or, or things like that. So I think that there was a lot of cooking going along, going on at home and, and a lot of plant-based food as well. In fact, so, so, so plant-based, you speak about plant-based food. Uh, some people 
uh, we'll know it by vegan, vegetarian. You, you'll explain uh, the, the specificities of all of that. Now, you've dedicated uh, a good part of, of your life over the past decade for, uh, in, in terms of getting the message out, um, uh, changed your own life, uh, changed your own eating habits. Um, Tell me how that, how that first happened on a personal basis, how you uh, made the switch to a, uh, to a plant, fully plant-based diet. So I had a very dear friend um, back in California, Elliot Washer, and he kept telling me, Susie, Susie, you gotta watch Forks Over Knives. It's a great movie. And um, typically when someone tells me to watch something or read something, I, I have a tendency to get it. I have stacks of, actually you can see, my books up in my <laughs> up in my shelf there, um, but I um, I grabbed this thing one day. I had had it on my shelf for about nine months, and I went down to the gym and I plucked it into the um, the DVD player, and about ten minutes into watching Forks Over Knives, I literally had to get off of the treadmill. And I, I, I found myself being incredibly angry and feeling almost betrayed that I had been advertised to my whole life that I needed animal products to be strong and I needed dairy to have strong bones and strong teeth. And it was completely the antithesis of that. Um, I then immediately went to my husband and I said, look, I need an hour and a half of your time tomorrow and he sort of said, well, great, yeah, so where are we gonna go? And I said, no, we're not gonna go anywhere, we're gonna watch a movie. And he said, well, cool, I like movies, what are we gonna watch? And I said, I'm not gonna tell you, but we're gonna watch it, and then I wanna have a conversation about it. And we sat down and we watched it, and from the time we were in the TV room into the kitchen, he said, we shouldn't have any more animal products in the house. I was approaching it from health, he basically started educating me on all the environmental issues of animal agriculture, which um, it's the second leading cause of greenhouse gases and climate change more than all transportation combined, every car, every airplane, every bus, every ship, everything. And it was that experience that, um, that really propelled me into the next chapter of my life and that's inspiring as many people as I can to eat plant-based. And I ended up writing a book about it called OMD, which is, uh, stands for One Meal a Day. Yeah, so can you tell us, tell us the story of where, where, where the name comes, the concept itself uh, comes from? Because it's an, it's an interesting way, we all, we've all, met someone uh, in our lives probably who has a diet like yours and they can, and people have the tendency, and I know at the beginning, the, the way you approach your own husband with a passion, right? And, and OMD, the OMD plan, your book, the OMD uh, plan and the, 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 the approach is different um, because we've all, we've all heard people come up to us and say, you need to completely change your diet, you need to go vegan, you need to be plant-based. Uh, so, so tell us uh, where the concept came from. Yeah, so yes, those, um, those vegan plant-based people out there, um, yeah, they kind of, so we became one of those people. Mm. We were born again vegans and born again, you know, plant-based people telling everybody that we came into contact with that they absolutely needed to go plant-based. Just overnight, that's what we did. We cleaned out our kitchen and within 24 hours, we had, um, we had goats actually up on our ranch. And so we would get goat yogurt and goat cheese and, and goat milk once a week. And um, we shipped off people, we shipped books out, we shipped DVDs out, and we just told everybody that that's what they needed to do. And people would literally see us coming and wanna turn around and run the other way. Um, so we were definitely up on our soapboxes and, and thinking we were kind of holier than thou. And um, I, I, I had started a school with my sister in, and it's an environmental school it's called Muse School, from, goes from two years old all the way through 18. 
and there's a huge component of sustainability that runs through it. We realized um, that in that we couldn't really call ourselves an environmental school and still be serving animal products. So we decided to take the school 100% plant-based. And um, it took 18 months to do it. We brought in doctors and climate scientists and authors and chefs and athletes to educate our children and our teachers and our families. And um, in the fall of 2015, we made the announcement that we were the first plant-based school in North America, and we promptly lost 50% of our children. Um, the good news is, is that we quickly regained our enrollment and surpassed it, and people started moving to the area so that they could send their children to that school uh, from the, all over the United States and some people from Europe as well. And our head of school got very frustrated with the families one day, and he said, people, you can feed them what you want for breakfast and you can feed them what you want for dinner. It's one meal a day. It's OMD. And so that's where the idea of OMD came from. And what um, we actually self-published a little book uh, called OMD. And I looked at that and I thought, you know what, this is a perfect opportunity to take this message out into the world. We had worked with climate scientists and we were, you know, explaining to the children that one person changing one of their meals a day to a plant-based meal for one year saves 200,000 gallons of water and the carbon equivalent of driving from Los Angeles to New York. So all of a sudden we realize it's like that's a much better approach to, you know, it, introducing the idea of being plant-based to people is just starting with one meal a day. You don't have to be perfect. It's an invitation. Dip your toe in. And it's, it's incredibly empowering to the individual because so many people, I think, get paralyzed that there's nothing that they can really do for the environment. Yes, they can change their light bulbs and they can recycle and that sort of thing, but there are a lot of people that sort of feel like, well, what can little old me do to help the environment? Well, every single time you put food on your plate, you're either hurting your health and the environment and the animals, or if you've got putting plant-based food on your plate, you're helping your health and the environment and the animals. And, you know, I always really like to talk about um, ultimately lots of people decide to go plant-based for a lot of different reasons. Mm. They might do it for the environment. They might do it for their health. They might do it for the animals. They might do it to lose weight. And if you've seen the movie Game Changers on Netflix, you might do it for your sex life. <laughs> But there's another reason now, and it's another reason that everyone is dealing with. It's the reason why we're all experiencing change now virtually, and it's because of a global pandemic. Hmm. 80, 70 to 80 percent of all diseases are created by the exploitation of animals. So that's another huge reason to start looking at putting plant-based food on your plate instead of instead of animal products. I mean, you can look at anthrax and monkeypox, SARS, bird flu, the Spanish flu of 1918, E. coli, salmonella, mm. COVID. Yeah. So it's, um, all, you know, the leading epidemiologists in the world are talking about the fact that, yes, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. There are more to come after this one. So let's make a difference in what we're eating and and avoid another pandemic. Yeah, and how do you see um, both on, a, on an individual level um, and as societies, um, how do you see this progression? I mean, it, it's very, uh, a, um, it's a different approach, it's a different way of communicating to say, dip your toe in the water, try it out, start to think about it, right? Um, but obviously, you know, you hope that they then stick another toe in the water 
and that, uh, that, that people get a taste of it and then go full plant-based and that society uh, eventually uh, phases out um, animal farming and, and, and meat-based diets. Uh, how, 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 how do you see the vision of this, of this growing over time? Uh, is, it, is it an individual thing? Is it, um, I mean, you're focused on really trying to inspire people and convince people. Um, how, do you, how do you see the coming, the coming 10 years, 20 years? Uh, there is this new awakening. As you say now, uh, COVID has, has woken us up to this other very immediate uh, reason to rethink our diets. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to tell you the truth, I think it's multi-pronged. Um, because I think that the, if you, if you start looking at, at investments, the, um, the plant-based food sector is the largest sector of the food industry, the largest, fastest growing, um, food sector. So beef industries are starting to invest in plant-based meats, dairy, huge dairy industries are starting to invest in plant-based milks. I mean, one of the statistics that that I had a couple of weeks ago was dairy, um, the, the dairy industry, um, their, um, their sales are, they're dropping by 5% annually. Mm. Plant-based milks are growing by double digits annually. So, I mean, you, you really have to look at what people are starting to invest in. And I think that the food supply chain, they're starting to look at how important it is to switch. I know here in New Zealand, they have made a big announcement, which, you know, they, I think that they're so brave down here on so many levels, but they want to reduce their livestock by 15% by 2030. And in order to do that, you have to come up with solutions. You have to come up with, with ideas for, for farmers to be able to pivot and for them to still be able to have lucrative ways of living. You can't just sort of, you know, take the animals out of their, out of their lives, whether they're, you know, growing meat or whether they're, um, you know, having, having cows on, on their land for, dairy products, you have to be able to help them and give them alternatives to other ways of making, uh, making money. Mm -hmm. Well, I talked before at the beginning about your, your fascinating biography uh, and your travels, uh, and it all began back in, in Oklahoma, and you had a family farm. Um, and, and I know you have a farm now, in New Zealand, T tell us a little bit about uh, the farmer's life uh, seen by by Susie Cameron. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's another uh, another really big piece to to say. I did grow up in Oklahoma, and you know, I grew up in Oklahoma City, but we have a farm that's that's um, between Oklahoma City and Dallas, and we grew cows and we grew pigs and we ate them. And my mom told us, you know, that we needed to drink our milk and in order to be healthy. And I didn't know any of this until May of 2012. So it's, um, it's, I know that, you know, some people are, are really thinking about the fact that, um, you know, it's like, how, why didn't I know? And why didn't anybody tell me this? And it's just starting to come out now. But it's, um, when we bought our farm here in New Zealand, this was before we went plant-based, we had a very, very lucrative uh, dairy on our, on our property. And then we decided to go plant-based and we looked at each other and we were like, well, we can't be growing cows to make dairy and, and, and so we shut it down and we started doing a lot of different experiments. We grew hemp, we grew um, vegetables. And the, one of the main things that we're, we're focusing on right now is brassica. So broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, kales, things like that. 
And um, we crunched some numbers about three, three to four weeks ago. And we were looking at how much meat could you get off of a hectare of land? And it turns out you can, for a full year, turns out you can get about a ton of meat off of one hectare of land. You can get 30 tons of vegetables, brassicas, which is what we're growing, off of a hectare of land. So you think about how many people you can feed by feeding them plants and grains off of a, a hectare of land instead of trying to feed them meat. Because the meat is grown, yes, they're fed grass and things like that, but for the most part, animals are fed grain. 70 to 80% of all soy and corn goes to feed animals. And the amount of people that you can feed off of all that corn and soy is astronomical. Mm -hmm. So I know uh, last January you were supposed to be here uh, at Change Now, um, and you, t you told me when we spoke yesterday that you got suddenly sick for the first time in eight years, and it may well have been COVID, and it prevented you from coming to Change Now, the Change Now that happened right before uh, the lockdown happened. Um, but you were, you were, you were coming here also to, to talk about the, that your book was out in French, and it is out in French. Um, and just to close up, I know you're coming back to Paris to bring it full circle um, in a few months for other personal, professional reasons. Tell us about that. I am. So I, um, yes, last year I ended up, um, <laughs> instead of coming to change now, I was in my hotel room um, with, um, by the time I got back to Los Angeles, I had full-blown pneumonia. I had not been sick at all in eight years, and I attribute that to being plant-based. But, um, so I didn't get to do my book tour of Un repas vegan par jour. Um, so I really, really am looking forward to coming back in September. And yes, I have some um, personal things that I'm, I'm going to be doing there, but I also am really looking forward to coming and, and promoting the book and, and promoting the idea of, of OMD um, in, in France. I, there are lots of chefs that make unbelievably beautiful plant-based food in Paris, and um, I'm really looking forward to to being there again. It's it is my home away from home. I I spent um, from 17 years old until I was 21 there, and um, I I really feel like it it really it completely formed who I am and how I operate in the world. Being able to to live in that amazing city and meet all the amazing people that I did. Excellent. Well, we look forward to, uh, to seeing you here in Paris. Um, and um, uh, you've also uh, um, given a little, a little teaser for, for our, 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 next, uh, our next panelist, who's, uh, uh, who will talk about some, some plant-based French food. Uh, so, so stay tuned uh, for the rest of the panel. Uh, but thanks so much for your, uh, for your time and all your thoughts, Susie. And, uh, and good luck with the farm. Jeff, thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to being back in Paris. And, and um, all I can say, and I'd like to leave this with everyone, just change one of your meals a day to a plant-based meal and know that you'll be doing something great for your health and great for the environment and great for the animals and great for your waistline and great for your sex life and no more pandemics. <laughs> That's... That's a strong message. Thanks, Susie. Be well. All right. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So uh, our, our next uh, speakers are giving uh, the keynote um, for the session on food. And uh, they're the founders, the co-founders of Les Nouveaux Fermiers, uh, Guillaume Dubois and Cédric Meston.
Do you know who is this man? It's Eric Bouchnoir. He's um, a French very famous chef. He's a mayor of de France and the executive chef of Joël Robuchon restaurants. As a representative of French cuisine and French tradition, do you think he would be keen to have plant-based meat in his restaurants? Well, we asked him one year ago. We met him, we explained we are developing innovative plant-based meat products that are good for the planet, good for health, and we wanted him to give a try. And the thing is that he refused. He said that with Mr. Robuchon a few years ago, he tasted it, uh, such products in the US and that he found it awful. So he was not in a very positive mindset about plant-based meat. And we understand this situation because he's a representative of French cuisine. And when it turns to innovation in the food area, in France, people are a bit suspicious. Well, we insisted a lot. And as he's a famous, curious and good chef, he accepted to try one more time. And he was actually that surprised to love the product, to enjoy them, that he decided to put them in one of his restaurants. And now today, you can have in a traditional French gastronomic restaurant, plant-based food. And do you know who is this man? He is Pierre Chapon, buyer in one of the largest retail chains in France, buyer in the meat category. And as a retail buyer, do you think that he will be willing to put plant-based food, so vegan food, in the meat aisle of a supermarket? Well, we met him again also a year ago, explaining him the same story that we did to Eric, that we are developing plant-based products, that it was good for health, good for the environment, and it was very close in time of taste to meat, and that we wanted him to taste, and he refused. We asked him if he could put it in the meat aisle of his supermarket. He said, no way, I cannot put vegan food in the, in the meat part of the supermarket. People don't know this category of product, and I don't think they will be willing to try it. And like with Eric, we insisted a lot. We explained things have changed, that now 41% of French people are willing to reduce their meat consumption, to put more vegetables in their plate. So we insisted and he finally tried the product. And he loved it. And a fun fact is the first time he even tasted it raw, so uncooked, because he saw that how it's supposed to be eaten which is not, by the way. Anyway, now, in France, in retail, you can have plant-based meat. Now, do you know who is, that per who is that person? Well, it's you, or it's supposed to be you. And while you, you're looking at this video, can you count how many times you've been eaten meat in the past seven days? If the number is less than three, it means that you're already becoming a flexitarian which means that you're trying to reduce your meat consumption either for health, for the planet, or for animals. If the number is higher, it means that you're not yet a flexitarian. Let's explain you our story, and let's see if we can convince you to try at least once plant-based food, and maybe then to, to, to change a little bit what you eat. So together, two years ago with Cédric, we co-founded Les Nouveaux Fermiers which means the new farmers in English. Our ambition was to create and develop French plant-based meat food that would be better for the planet, better for health, and of course, super tasty. Because if it's not tasty, people won't eat it. It's as simple as that. So it started in our kitchen, uh, our kitchen, uh, and we started with a burger because everyone loves burger. And so we worked and the first version of the burger was awful really awful and we worked we worked all the passionate and talented people joined us and after hundreds and thousands of tests we were satisfied with the results and why only burger we did also chicken chunks to have in caesar salad nuggets that you can have in a sauce um, ground beef for lasagna or sausages if you want to have hot dogs always keeping our motto which is taste health and planet and then the challenge was to move from a situation where we have a few kilograms in the kitchen to a few tons 
that we can produce every day for everyone. And we are very proud to open the first plant-based meat factory in France, while at this moment, all the other ones were in the US, in Germany, in the UK, or in Eastern Europe. Communication about plant-based food is not that easy. As you've seen with Eric and Pierre, people are often reluctant to new ideas, to innovation, and especially in food. That's why we mostly use social media at the beginning to show to customers and potential customers pictures of the product, recipes, and testimonies of people, especially influencers, who are trying the products for the first time. Actually, when people try it, it's already won, as the repurchasing rate is quite high. Our goal is to make plant-based meat mainstream. It means first available in most supermarkets, where we try to be available in the meat aisle, so that meat lovers who don't go to the vegan area try the product for the first time. It's also being available in restaurants, where we aim that every single restaurant in France should have a vegetable meal, for example, a plant-based burger. And of course, we're also available online, where we can ship our products to customers in less than two days in all France. So we have this purpose of making plant-based food mainstream. Why do you think this is so important to us? Well, we all know that we are facing an environmental and climate crisis. It's just a fact, and now it's time for actions and solutions. And we are deeply convinced that at personal level, we can already have a huge impact. A study from Carbon Cat, for example, showed that 25% of the change needs to change from the personal level, from consumer habits. Let's take a few examples of things that we can do, that we try to do. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. First example, you just lower the temperature of, of your place by one or two degrees, per, by example. It already have a huge impact. Or take the bicycle once you are in the city instead of the car. Or also no longer take the plane. Or, of course, having half of your meals that are without meat. Among these solutions, which one do you think will have the highest impact on the environment? Well, it's becoming vegetarian. Uh, <laughs> indeed, cows must consume 16 pounds of vegetables to produce one pound of meat. So it has a high impact on the overall land and water consumption. If we are all becoming vegetarian, it's theoretical, we will achieve a third of the global carbon neutral objective. So this is theoretical, but it means that reducing even partially your meat consumption will have a significant impact on the overall climate change. So do you want to try? Summer is a good time to try new food. That's why we created plant-based meat sausages, which are in fact merguez and chipolata, which are very French thing that you can have on the barbecue. And the idea is that it's 11 times less CO2 than real sausages. It's twice less fatty than real sausages. And we believe we firmly believe that it's even tastier than real sausages. And we have a challenge for you. The idea is that you need to trick your friends. We often do it. So in, you invite them at a barbecue or at a normal dinner. You bring plant-based meat and you pretend, of course, it's real meat. And if you manage to trick your friends, and we believe you will, you send us the video, you tag us, for example, on Instagram. And the winner, the one with the most engagement, will win his or her own weight in plant-based sausages. So that will make a lot of plant-based sausages for you. Well, we thank you for your time. You, we hope you enjoyed the time with us and we're looking forward to see your video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Guillaume, uh, Cedric. Um, our next guest, our next speaker is uh, Paul uh, Malloy. Malfoy, I'm sorry, who's the CEO uh, of a young startup, also um, um, in, the in the sector of food, but on the distribution end and looking for sustainable uh, solutions there. So we'll be right back with Paul Malfoy.
Thanks for being here, Paul. Hi, thanks, Jeff. So um, with every new startup, we've just heard from uh, your colleagues at the Les Nouveaux uh, Fermiers, um, who are a little bit more advanced in their, in their development. Um, you're a very young startup. Um, tell, us, tell us about um, uh, Protem. Tell us, um, tell us the why, 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 what it is, and why uh, the world needs it. Yeah, well, the idea first came from um, a common wish to, to build something with a positive impact on the planet. Um, I know it's quite unusual to start from the desire instead of the, of the, of the idea, mm. but actually it's what really matters for us. So my two associates and I have like, you know, common basis in science and biology. And because we are aware of the climate change, we, we started to, to search for specific challenge to address. And so we started to deep dive into food wastage in one hand and overuse of plastic. And actually we noticed that both topics are quite connected. So we started to, to dream of a, a solution that could address both topics. And actually that was the starting point of our journey. So, you know, I at this time we already worked and we were actually quite happy on our jobs. Um, but with our knowledge of what's happening, we at least needed to try to do something. Mm. And so, yeah, that's how we created um, ProTem. Okay. And so tell us exactly what, what ProTem is. So, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, the three, uh, the, the, the three different sessions are, uh, we've, we've heard about the consumption, how, how consumption needs to change to uh, address the issues of climate change, uh, the production um, in terms of finding new products um, that will change people's habits. Uh, it seems as though yours is in the general realm of, of distribution. It's, uh, tell, tell, us, tell us exactly what, what it is. Well, uh, ProTem is, is developing a natural coating solution for fruits and vegetables. Um, actually, it acts like um, a second skin um, and it grants uh, to the product two kinds of protection. So um, a physical barrier that limits gas exchanges between the fruits and the atmosphere and a microbiological one that um, protects the product against a very broad spectrum of pathogens, so either fungi or bacteria. Um, what's, what is really important to notice is that this coding is totally invisible, um, and most important, it's totally edible. It means that, of course, you can eat it with the product. You can also put it off if you want underwater. And um, it is also, well, odorless, tasteless, biodegradable, and what we call um, biocompatible, mm. which means uh, basically, of course, totally harmless for the end consumer. Okay. So this is, this is what we do, and we aim to substitute um, the use of chemicals in the post-harvest industry of fruits and vegetables. And, well... If I can add something, you know, in France, we, we, we have a, a law called Loi AGEC in French, uh, standing for anti-waste um, law for a circular economy mm. uh, that slowly prohibits the use of plastics in every, yeah, every economical sector. And um, we have that chance at Pretend that uh, next year, actually the 1st of January, um, the, the use of plastic for fruits, for conditioning fruits and vegetables under a weight of one and a half kilogram will be, uh, will be prohibited. Mm. And well, this is a chance for us to, um, to, to rethink our, our way of consumption. And, um, and actually, the, one of the way um, that retailers and distributors are, are seeing is uh, selling in bulk. But bulk also has like um, a dark side because it allows what we call cross-contamination. Um, so basically when you, you have a, a contaminated fruit or vegetable in a, uh, in a bulk, um, 
you have a lot of chances that the, the full um, the full bulk will be also contaminated. Mm. And um, our coding is also able well to limit this worst case scenario. I see. And so just to understand a little better to, to envision what what your product, your invisible product looks like it's or, or how it's uh, um, what the process is. So so this is is put on a fruit or vegetable after it's harvested uh, and I guess before it's shipped um, and 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 then the end consumer uh, has it they can do, do you do you notice it in some way can you feel it can you uh, touch it can you well, if I had with me um, one coated and one non-coated fruit, uh, you won't be able to notice to notice the difference. But um, you know, if you um, well, if you put it in the water, it it makes like a, a gel, and you you would notice notice okay. it. So so yes, but to be totally transparent, we're still developing the product. Okay. So you you won't be able to see it today in an industry, but we're working on it. Um, and yeah, we, we have to, to, to be at the very b beginning of this logistic chain mm. to be really efficient. So yeah, yeah we aim to, uh, just after the harvest of fruits or, or vegetables, we, we target this specific area where, where we, we will be able to, to code these fruits. Mm. Um, yeah. Tell us, so, so it's interesting, this is obviously uh, um, an, ambitious, an ambitious project. Uh, it's a it's a um, a solution um, that if it works, if it's ad adopted, could could uh, revolutionize the the, the way that um, fruits and vegetables are distributed. And so, for you as an entrepreneur, and you talked about having a job and saying, "No, I want to do something that I care about. Um, I have a project of my own." What's what's the process been like uh, here in France? Uh, um, in Europe, thinking of this ambitious global uh, global solution, um, you said you have two two co-founders, and so how has that process been? How long have you been 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 at it? Well, we we are working on the project since um, two years now. Okay, but uh, really at hundred percent on it only um, since the the beginning of this year, actually. Okay, um, but y you know I. <laughs> When I was a student, I went, was uh, one of these um, students that never really knew what he wanted to do. Mm. And um, I had a lot of work experiences, a lot of internships, and it never really and entirely satisfied me. I always focused on how futile and pointless uh, my work was to spend days on building PowerPoints that will never be read by any company or any clients. Mm. And, um, well, I guess it's how it became an idea in my head. And uh, you know, when, it, we have, when you have the opportunity to work on something you really believe in and with um, um, brilliant friends and co-founders, I, I guess it's how it works and, and, and you start to, to think about it. Mm. But to be honest, I never imagined to, when I, when I was a student, I never imagined to, to build my own company. Mm. Um, I don't know, I, I guess it, uh, it became obvious when I started to work and to see um, how, how it really works and uh, how company can be. Mm. And I, I see it as, a, yeah, as an opportunity to, to build something uh, meaningful and with people um, who want to bring meaning in their, in their work. Mm. Uh, and so it's really the beginning for us, so I won't have like large talk about that, but uh, I guess uh, we, we, we'll We'll do everything we can to 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 achieve this goal, and uh, yeah. Mm -mm. No, I mean it, the the having this kind of energy and this desire uh, and ideas is uh, is a key component when you talk about uh, the looking for uh, uh, overall solution to the to the question of of climate change and waste and pollution, uh, changing the means of production and distribution of all the products in our lives. Um, and so the, um, this kind of, this, this energy that comes from, from entrepreneurs and particularly uh, those who have a technical background. And so, so you know, uh, how has it been for you and your colleagues to sort of um, think of 
um, think of the business of it, the, the strategy of it, as opposed to, you know, there, there's figuring out the science and there's figuring out the business. So, so um, what are those conversations like amongst your uh, co-founders? Well, actually, this is the challenge to, to mix the science and business. And um, we're working on it like every day and uh, we're trying to, to reach this goal. Um, but how it looks like, well, to be honest, I, I don't really know. Um, uh, we, you know, we, we try to, to, to put science into business and in, into real life. As I started to explain earlier, um, we, we started with the wish of doing something instead of the idea. So because we are scientists, we decided to search and to make a lot of research on what's public actually, but not necessarily accessible to anyone. And we started to see many different technologies and many different uh, things that are researched in many laboratories around the world. And um, well, I guess we, we found something that um, firstly interested us and we, we saw in that, in that technology something that would be able to substitute and to, to address both of these challenges, I mean food wastage and overuse of plastic. And well, we, we, yeah, we, we work hard on the, on the tech mm -hmm. and um, we have the chance to be, um, to be accompanied by uh, two incubators, one more on the scientific side, which is called uh, Genopole. Um, it is actually the first biocluster in France um, and the other one is the, the incubator of, um, of Ecole Polytechnique, and they help us a lot to, you know, to, to, to put it together and to try to, to think about the business afterwards. Mm. So this is how we, we do and how it works for us, at least for now. Okay, and so the plans, the timeline, your, your, um, the calendar of, of when you hope to have the, the science figured out, to, to bring it to, uh, to potential investors, partners, clients? What's, uh, what's the timeline? Well, it's always really hard to, um, to tell um, mm. and to answer that question. Uh, what I can tell you is that we are working hard on it. Um, I hope that we will be ready by the end of this year. Um, and actually we're already ready to maybe to raise money, but we really want to wait that the tech is uh, we, ha we have a, a first prototype and a functional one. Um, but yeah, I guess until uh, the, the end of this year and, um, and, uh, and then we, we'll see, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll hire more people and we'll see how it, uh, how it goes. But yeah, I guess end of this year. Okay, well, it's exciting. It's a project that uh, even though it's invisible, that you can envision it and you can uh, imagine how it could change uh, the way uh, the way we get our our, our produce um, and the way we consume it, and and it sounds like with potentially um, uh, impressive benefits for for the climate and for reducing uh, reducing waste. Uh, so good luck, Paul. Thank you. Let Thanks us know so uh, how it goes and. Um, so I want to thank uh, all, all our speakers today, um, Paul Malloy of uh, ProTem. Uh, we had uh, Cedric um, Meston and Guillaume Dubois of Les Nouveaux Fermiers. And finally, Susie Amos Cameron, who was in, uh, uh, in touch from New Zealand uh, with her uh, OMD plan, uh, one meal per day. Um, talking about it, the shift to a plant-based diet. And uh, I want to thank you all of you for uh, tuning in, and we'll see you next time.